Hi, my name is Marisa Inda and I am the current IPF world champion in the 52 kilo class. And today I'm going to talk to you about uh, sciatic pain that I've been dealing with ever since the world championships. Um, had a whole training block that I had to go through to compete at Raw Nationals, which took place in October. So from June through October and even up till now, I've been dealing with uh, inflamed piriformis and sciatic. So today I'm going to talk to you about some of the corrective exercises that we did leading up to nationals as well as how Chad manipulated my training block for going into that meet and just how you can manage your expectations when you're dealing with an injury. Anytime you train for an extended period of time and you're training hard, annoyances and little injuries are going to happen but it's really important that you're able to pivot your training so that you're still able to progress without making anything any worse. Before we get into any of the corrective exercises that I did, Dr. Quinn Hanak is going to explain to you uh, the common issues that arise with sciatic and why it happens. Hey guys, Quinn Hannock here of Juggernaut Training Systems and Clinical Athlete. We're talking about Marissa Inda and the injury that she sustained at Worlds. And so we can kind of describe it as a, a nerve type pain, commonly referred to as sciatica, essentially the athletes feeling discomfort down the back of the leg into sometimes the lower leg, could be the side of the lower leg, could be down the middle, and sometimes even into the foot and toes. Now, before I go any further, I wanna make a disclaimer that this video is meant to be a description of a case study. This was a particular situation in which I evaluated Marissa and we deemed uh, the things that, that she did as interventions as appropriate for her case. Just because it, it, things were effective for her and she seems to be doing very well does not mean that if you have the same symptoms, these are the exact recommendations for you. So I would highly recommend you don't just watch this video if you're having pain shooting down the back of your leg, you should go get checked out by a healthcare provider first, uh, preferably one from the clinical athlete directory, and then we can talk about kind of exercise prescription from there. So just keep that in mind, please. Uh, having said that, so you know any injury we can chalk up, especially at the barbell world, we can chalk up to the dosage of the load was past the tissue's tolerance to recover or adapt. Could be chronically or it could be in the moment. Marissa's situation was more of an acute bout of stress that overloaded her system. So it was a pull at Worlds. She had told me that she maybe lost position a little bit. It was a heavy weight. And on top of that, she had to sit. It was a long, you know, many, many hours in, in the airplane. However, the main trigger was that acute incident with the deadlift. So it's simply load surpassing the tolerance of the tissue, period. It happens. This is the inherent risk of peaking for a big meet like that and trying to push your limits. And so we kind of sign off on that as, as barbell sport athletes. Uh, so what she was dealing with was a sensitivity to a specific position. And that position was having her hips kind of in, in a hinged position where her knee is, is almost fully extended and the back of her leg, all the tissues involved are tensioned, including the nerve. So very much the deadlift or the hip hinge position. That's what she was very, very sensitive to, which makes sense because that was the position that she overloaded the tissue. So the, again, her symptoms commonly referred to as sciatica was just sensitivity running down the back of her leg. She, Mar Marissa was a very flexible person. She had lots of range of motion just in general, but she, when she came to see me, she could barely bend forward with her hands past her knees, even with a rounded back, let alone with a straight back. And so her body was in protection mode. Essentially her range of motion was, was decreased because her body was trying to protect her from that position to go in there. And we're gonna respect that. So the exercises that we gave Marissa uh, the concept is called graded exposure, or we're attempting to desensitize the symptoms or the, the irritated tissue, in this case, probably the nerve, uh, over time. So we let Mother Nature do her thing, and then we slowly grade the exposure back to the provocative positions as she gains more and more tolerance and more and more range of motion. So we'll take you through some of these exercises, and then we'll explain that concept. So for me, after the World Championships, um, I had my last pull on my deadlift, the bar slipped a little bit out of my hand and it caused a little bit of a shift. Uh, I felt fine, I didn't have like any pain associated with that. Uh, we left for, a, for Spain right after Worlds, Worlds was in Russia and that was maybe about a six and a half hour uh, flight sitting 
and then another five and a half hour train ride after that. So I started to feel like really uh, dull pain and ache in my left glute. And I kind of noticed bending over to tie my shoe, going into the hinge position started to hurt. I started feeling like a very sharp pain going down my left leg down into my ankle. And so I knew something had happened. I just didn't know what. It, it, it was really frustrating because I couldn't really pinpoint exactly, like there was no pop, no pain, anything like that. It just started a dull ache that just gradually just wouldn't go away. Um, laying down in bed, it would hurt. Sitting down on the toilet would hurt. Hinging especially hurt the most. Benching, getting it into any type of position into benching would hurt. So um, yeah, it was just very frustrating. It, just to not even, not only to not feel good during training, but more importantly, just not feel good outside of training. So just everyday things would hurt. Just the dread of just getting out of bed, sitting in my car for an extended period of time would hurt. So again, it was just a very dull ache in my glute, radiating down into my leg, sitting for extended period of time, um, and actually even just laying down on my stomach would cause a lot of pain. So after Worlds, the next meet that I had to prepare for was the Raw Nationals, which was in October. So that gave me um, from probably July into October to get ready for that. That meet was October 9th. So when I had talked to Chad, I'd, I let him know that I was not able to do any type of hinging. So, you know, bending down into this position to get into the deadlift really, really hurt. Um, squatting, putting the bar into a low bar position actually kind of started aggravating my lower back and it, it it didn't hurt when I squat, but mentally I felt apprehensive getting into the hole. So that, or considering I already come from having like confidence issues in the squat, that didn't help help things. It just kind of made me slow down. And um, knowing that I had to compete, if I didn't have to compete, it would have been great. I would have taken an extended break so that I could heal up. But knowing that I had to do raw nationals in order to defend my world championship title in June, in 2018, I knew that I, we had to do something so that I was able to compete in October. So we just decided to adjust my training so that I wouldn't hurt anything any further so that I could still get good work in and do just enough to win the championship. So now we're going to get into some of the methods of recovery that we used in order to get me ready for raw nationals. So these include uh, changes in training load, changes in exercise selection or my exercise technique, rehab and corrective exercise, manual therapy, and recovery adaptive strategies. And then I'll be talking some about the mental aspect of dealing with injury. So one of the first things that we did was adjust the intensity, the loads of my training. So that meant that I couldn't go as heavy because the heavier weights aggravated my back and my uh, left leg. So in order to still get the necessary work in, we had to increase volume. Um, lower intensity increased the volume of all my stuff. Um, we also had to adjust my uh, pulling. I wasn't able to pull from the floor conventional. So we started with very light loads pulling from blocks as well as doing sumo pulling. Because in the very beginning, since I wasn't able to hinge, we still had to do sumo work because we weren't really sure if I was gonna pull sumo at the meet or pull conventional. Um, because sumo pulling, I wouldn't have to hinge. We were kind of playing around with maybe having to do uh, sumo pulling at the meet. So it was very light conventional block pulls and a lot more volume on squat and bench. A couple other changes that we made to my training were benching with my feet up. Putting my feet down and getting my feet on the floor was probably the most painful thing, even leading all the way up until the day of the meet. Um, so I put my feet up all the way up until I got to maybe my top sets and then I would put my feet down just for the top set. And even then they were elevated on blocks, which is something that I've never had to do at a meet or in training, but it alleviated the pain and it allowed me to get in the heavier work without causing a lot more pain. We also incorporated just direct glute training um, just to strengthen the glute area. This is kind of a weakness that, I, that we discovered that I had, which was causing a lot of the piriformis pain. So direct, a lot more direct glute work as well. Another technique that we used was uh, corrective exercises that were prescribed to me by Dr. Quinn, um, which were uh, neural flossing as well as static stretching of the piriformis. So I'll let Dr. Quinn explain a little bit more about the benefits of that. Okay, so Marissa is doing something very simple here. She's just putting her leg in, again, the position that was provocative, which is this hip hinge position. Basically just the, the hip is flexed. It's flexed up. It, it's an exaggerated version of like, say a single leg RDL or something like that. But she's putting the, the nerve on tension is, is the point here. And then the other leg, you're getting a little bit of a sustained mobilization through the back of the hip 
um, which again can kind of feel nice. So you can actually do this on both sides to get the hips to move a little bit. And the idea is not that you're changing structure or creating permanent you know, flexibility changes or something like that. What you're, just, what you're doing is, is trying to get to knock down that excessive protective tone that the nervous system is, is providing. And tone just means that my, my range of motion has decreased since my symptoms have started. My body, my pain perception is on blast. And as a result, I can't move as far as I normally do. And so something like this, again, gets both hips to move. So you take the one hip and you can just flex it as far as you can comfortably. And the knee, Marissa's got the left knee fully extended there. You don't even have to do that. You can slack the nerve by bending the knee. So you don't have to straighten it. You just straighten it to your tolerance. And then you also notice that she was flexing the ankle, plantar flexing, dorsiflexion, the ankle. And that also tensions the, that branch of the nerve that goes all the way down. So the idea is that you can slack it in certain ways by flexing the hip or extending it to a degree, flexing the knee or extending it to a degree, and then you can flex and extend the ankle. And so you're just kind of moving the tissues in the posterior leg throughout their pathways back and forth. And it's just a, sometimes can be a very effective way to desensitize. You're not trying to recreate sharp pain. You're not trying to recreate the pain that you're feeling radiating down the back of your leg. You're actually trying to, over time, make that go away by getting into the positions. So you may feel some, a little bit of your familiar discomfort, that's totally normal, but the idea is that you move through uh, slow, controlled repetitions, gentle repetitions, and that sensitivity should start to dwindle. Okay, very similar concept here, and you could do both exercises, the, the first one that you saw and this one, or you could just do this one. They're, they're doing very, very similar things. The advantage of this exercise in particular is that you have a wall to be your support system. And so you can inch, Marissa at this point is feeling pretty good, but there was in the very, very beginning, she could not straighten that knee. So you see how she's keeping the knee bent. And so that slacks the, the tension or slacks the nerve or all the tissues in the back of the leg that are sensitized. And then you can straighten it as much as you need. And then again, you can use the ankle to tension that area as well. And you see she straightens the knee a little bit more. Go to the point of your initial discomfort, but not sharp pain or a high degree of apprehension to the position. And just kind of let your body acclimate to it. So slow reps, you don't have to count, you know, it's not a set of eight and you're done. Maybe you set a timer. I'm gonna spend three minutes today um, doing this type of graded exposure or nerve flossing as it's sometimes referred to as. And then I'm gonna gauge my response. If at the end of the three minutes I'm feeling better, then make note of that. And then maybe the next day you can hit that again or maybe even go a little bit longer or we can progress. But let's say, at the end of three minutes, your symptoms are actually worse and they're a little hot, but you had made note that maybe after one minute, it feels better. So uh, chop down your time or your volume a little bit and just kind of progressively work into your tolerance. You can do it on, certainly can do it on both sides. Um, but just remember there's no, mother nature is gonna do her thing if you let it. And so we're just trying to reacclimate and to these, to these positions, so gain positional tolerance. And then I'm gonna make one note here that we had a third exercise. It was, if you guys are familiar with a, just a Romanian deadlift and an RDL, um, where you're hip hinging, your knees are slightly bent and you're just hinging at the hips and folding forward. So w with no symptoms, you know, you know, a healthy athlete, you would feel a stretch in your hamstrings, a normal stretch. What we did, we did that with Marissa as a way to, again, grade the exposure back to her deadlift position. But we did it with a kettlebell so that she could have the, the weight in between her legs, like in between her knees, and the weight was directly under her body, which is a much more forgiving position than if she had a barbell in front where she has to move the barbell in front of her shins and the knees. So that would put way more tension on the, the posterior aspect of the thighs and all of that tissue and those nerves. And when she first came to see me, she just couldn't tolerate that. But what we did was a kettlebell sustained hold RDL. It was very light. I think that we, you know, Marissa can deadlift 400 plus pounds or, or close to, and we were using a 30 pound kettlebell. And she would hinge forward as far as she could, just 
to the point of beginning to feel her familiar symptoms, not to the point of severe or sharp pain, not to the point of, of apprehension to the position because we wanted her to be able to hold. So she would hinge over and then she would hold for four or five breaths. And if she could go a little further down with each breath, we would do that too. But if not, she would come right back up and we would maybe do five to eight reps like that. We'd hit that two or three times a day. And it was never about playing tug of war with your nervous system. It was never about trying to jam through the neural tension that you feel because you will lose that battle. Your nervous system will just sensitize even more. It'll put the brakes on even more. You've got to just meet it where it's, where it's at. Um, and then the great thing about the hinge or the RDL position as well in regards to this is that you can bend your knees a little bit more. So you can make the RDL a little bit more squatty than you normally would maybe when you're healthy or in training, but that puts a little bit of slack in, but you're, it puts a little slack in those tissues, but it also still tensions them. So it's just a way, again, to, to reacclimate to the position, to gain tolerance to that provocative position over time with the expectation that mother nature is doing her thing on the back end. And so that's a case that we worked through with Marissa. She was very, very compliant. She had the great thing and probably the most effective thing in her case was that she had Chad Wesley Smith as her coach who is very good about um, creating variations and modifying training to one, still get a training response or as best you can, but number two, not exacerbate the exact symptoms that we're trying to dwindle away. So keep in mind these exercises are not gonna do a thing if you're just hammering and recreating your symptoms in training. So, Positional modifications, training modifications, plus examples of graded exposure. And this is kind of like rehab 101 in this case for uh, posterior leg pain after deadlifting. Another thing that I did that I found uh, that personally helped me was doing manual therapy, which was seeing my massage therapist as well as seeing a chiropractor. Um, I felt that I personally, it, it made things feel a little bit better. It felt like it loosened up the piriform, especially the massage loosened up the piriformis area as well as getting like a weekly adjustment on my hip and my pelvis. It allowed me to, at least in my opinion, it felt like I was able to better maintain better positioning when I was squatting. So I felt like those two things definitely helped a lot as well. Last method that we used was a recovery adaptive strategies, which for me um, included cryotherapy, uh, localized cryo on the piriformis area, as well as uh, taking Advil and ibuprofen. Um, I know there was a lot of comments on the, the Nationals video about, oh my God, don't be taking Advil. I actually only took the ibuprofen at the meet and on my top sets when I got into peaking block for benching. I never took the ibuprofen or the Advil during training because I wanted to feel where things were hurting. This allowed me to stop when I needed to stop. It allowed me to know when I needed to push and pull back on exercises, so this way I wouldn't hurt anything any further. A lot of times if you're gonna take ibuprofen or Advil, it dampens the pain. And during training, you definitely wanna feel when things are hurting so you know when to stop. So anytime you're dealing with an injury, it can be the most frustrating thing, especially if you're coming off of like really good meets. I was coming off of an awesome meet at the Arnold, um, winning the world championships, and then it's like the expectations that you not only place on yourself, but the expectations from others of, oh, what are you gonna do at nationals? I bet you're gonna you know, squat more, bench more, pull more, and knowing going into your next meet that that's just not gonna happen, the PRs aren't gonna be there. So it can definitely be frustrating. Um, and there, I think it's, you'd be kidding yourself to say like, oh, it's just, you just deal with it and you, you, know, you, you go about your training. But there were moments for me where I was really frustrated and Chad had to sit me down and tell me, you know, no, you know what? We're just going in to win and that's it. Looking back at, at the Arnold and at Worlds and going, okay, all I need to do is just do just enough just to win, heal up so that I can go into my next meets that are more important and do well at those. So for me, it was just managing my expectation, knowing that this meet wasn't going to be a PR meet. It was a meet to get me through to do well to the meets that mattered that were most important to me, which is going to be Worlds in June in 2018. So had to just focus on the smaller victories. So for me, those smaller victories meant, hey, today I could put my feet down and it didn't hurt as bad as two weeks ago. Or, um, you know, I was able to squat today, even though it wasn't maybe what I had done in my last training block, it didn't hurt as bad as it hurt two weeks ago. Knowing that every day of training just means it's progressing towards feeling better and feeling being back to 100%. And also just being thankful, that, hey, I'm still able to actually lift pretty heavy weight may not be where I, my expectations are, but I'm still able to do, my body's still allowing me to do pull 
relatively heavy, squat heavy, bench heavy, and I'm not even at 100%. So those kind of things help me get through, you know, the frustration of being injured. So if you're somebody that's dealing with sciatic issues or, or injuries or piriformis injuries, I hope this video helps you a little bit. You know you're not alone. Um, you, do, you will get through it. There are gonna be highs and there's gonna be lows, but if you just stay the course, don't push it, um, do the prehab so that you don't have to deal with a reoccurrence of, of the pain, you will get through it. Um, if you like this video, please subscribe to the Juggernaut YouTube channel and thank you.